Welcome to Accounting 160, Principles of Managerial Accounting, Part 1. Before I jump into everything, I do want to say thank you for your emails and your comments. They are very, very important to me. This course has generally been taught by me on numerous semesters, but they've been taught on a virtual basis. And virtual courses generally do not have the interaction, the, um, the interaction in the, the weekly lectures that normal face-to-face -face classes have. So that was an incorrect assumption on my end. But I do want to say thank you for your emails because you alerted me to the reality that remote teaching is available in many of the courses taught at Hack. With that being said, we're going to meet every week, twice a week, on Monday and Wednesday, with the exception of today. And we're going to talk about what's happening during the week. What you see in front of you now, hopefully, is a copy of the home screen of our classroom. I want to get you a little familiar with the course setup because I think that's going to be very helpful when you'd want to have questions answered, you want to uh, look for your grade, but also when we talk and, just, and we chat within our discussions. Discussions are a very important part of the class because it allows us to engage on different topics and really get our, um, get our feet wet with talking about different areas um, that are covered during the week. So discussions, even though we are going to be meeting twice a week, I still want to see discussions, replies, as well as engagement. They allow us to practice different concepts and, and different problems and also interact with your other classmates in a forum that you can see their work and they can see yours. There's no wrong or right here. It's all about getting involved and being engaged in learning, in particular learning principles of managerial accounting. Many of you have said hello to me and I and asked and said hello to everybody in the class and I encourage you if you have not Introduce yourself to the class. Usually during our sessions on Monday and Wednesday, and we may not be able to engage a lot. It may very well be structured. It may very well be problem solving. So a discussion area is really where we can take a little bit of the restrictions off and talk about things and be more elaborate and take the time we need to communicate, but also ask questions of others and ask questions of me. As you can see, partly from the screen, you'll see the course home, content, discussions, Dropbox, quizzes, grades, email, and etc. I'm going to switch to the student mode so I can make it so that you can see based on your being a student. So here we go. As a student, you'll see your, on your first page your announcements. And what I try to do each week is provide announcements that say what we're going to be doing, particularly when we're working on very, very complex topics that may require us to jump right in and start working problems, which will not necessarily be part of my conversations with you. So I want to use this announcement form as a written document of what to expect this week, what we're going to cover, what we're going to talk about, and then to gauge the, the, the classroom. So that's going to always be there. You're going to always see each week what's going to be going on. In the class, if you scroll down a little bit, and hopefully you can see, let me know. Um, I've sent you a, a very long email about the lessons that we'll have and where they'll be held and your link that you'll be using. Here is module one and what we're talking about. When we talk about our modules, each module may have one or two chapters in them. And I try to frame these modules in such a way that you can see um, kind of a grouping of specific topics in a more logical way. Um, and I try to really come close to matching the textbook because when, as you're reading, you want the modules within the online component and your homework to match. If they can, sometimes they don't always match, which means that further communications and our discussions throughout the week will be able to clarify. But in this module, we're going to talk about the fundamentals of managerial accounting. What is it? What is not? And why is it important as part of the, the total depth and the breadth of accounting? It's just one small piece of this very large uh, field or discipline called accounting. So here you'll just see basically what we're covering, some outcomes that I think you should learn as you proceed through. Now, as you go further, I'm going to try to do this so you can see it. You'll see a start here, course syllabi, learning activities, and assessments. You should not have any issues getting into the start here, course syllabi, learning activities, because I did not put dates on them. However, for assessments, you'll see date sensitive items, meaning you can only go into those items during a certain period of time. And we'll talk about that in a minute. 
The course syllabi is here, and you'll print that. Hopefully, you'll print that out so you can have it for your reference. Um, let me know if you have any questions about the content. I try to have office hours at least once a week, but I want to talk to students to see what time works best for them because, again, it all matters. Um, me being available what works best for you. So let's leave that date and time open. I have it on my syllabus, but let's see if we can make certain that the syllabus um, denotes the time that we as a group would be best um, able to meet um, if you have questions or problems or just you just, just need maybe um, tutoring for something. So I will put that date there, but I will make certain to change it as we need to because I do want to be available for your help when it's necessary. The next is going to be the learning activities. And again, the learning activity is going to follow a very similar structure. It's going to have your module that we're going to be working on and the relevant chapters that are covered in that module. And as you can see here on the screen, you can only see module one, chapter one, managerial accounting. Within here, you'll see the video lecture, which I'm going to talk about. And you'll see other types of things, the printout of the PowerPoint presentation that might be helpful for you to um, grasp the material in this course. I'm going to go back to my content browser again. And I'm going to show you also, just as a screenshot, looking at the different modules that you'll be going through each week, the video lecture, the PowerPoint presentation for each module, and then the assessments. In this course, I believe top generally that discussion topics are very, very important. It, it allows you also to talk about how you understand the material and your understanding of how to apply a particular principle. So it's, it's very, very important. It is not just one-sided me talking to you, but I want you to talk back to me and to show me what you've learned and have any questions that you might have. And who knows, your, your classmate might have the same question. Being said, they are the discussion part of your grade. Also, if you look at this portion here, it's the homework. Homework is not intended to be difficult. Um, if my memory serves, I believe I have um, allowed you to have two opportunities to do your homework, meaning you go click onto your homework for the assignment. And if you submit it and I like your grade, you can always go back. Homework is allowing you to, um, to practice. I've always believed in practice and accounting is essential. It's essential to be able to practice. Practice, practice, practice. It's absolutely important. So I don't like to see you work on a problem and you really don't understand it. You did a good grade, but you really want to go back and do it again. And with this course, I think um, the opportunity for you to redo it is always there for you if you need to. You don't have to. The next step then is going to be the paper and the midterm and final ethics exam. I'm going to move this over just a little bit. So you can see it. Um, again, a part of your grade, um, just ethics. In the real world, we're dealing with real problems. And we want to be able to navigate ourselves through those problems. An ethics case study is a real life situation. And your job is to read a, an article that I've given you and summarize that article, but also base your opinion on it. Ethics is going beyond what's right and wrong. It's really what's best. And we have rules and we have laws, but Sometimes you don't break a law to be unethical. And the question then becomes, what does that mean? And that's this is the assignment that you'll be working on. The midterm and the final exam follows this similar structure as the, as the homework and that there are going to be multiple choice. Possibly um, you might see a short answer, but for the most part, multiple choice would be um, what you'll be looking at. So the, the goal here in this course in the seven weeks is to familiarize you with the managerial accounting. So what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is talk about first chapter of this course. But before I do so, remember, use the discussions to ask questions. There's area in the discussions to ask questions, something you don't understand. Because not only will I be answering those questions, but also I am looking to all of you to answer them as well. Answer the questions. You, if you see your student, your classmate is um, struggling on something that you already know the answer to, jump in and I will confirm here in the in the Q&A is all of us together working to find solutions to problems and issues that we encounter throughout the course to provide clarity and also provide guidance when needed. So feel free to use that as a tool to communicate with everybody about questions. Obviously, um, very personal questions, you should direct them to me in an email or even call me and have my information on your syllabus. Give me a call and we can talk about it and help you. Um, as far as these dates are concerned, um, 
I realize we are in a world with so much going on at us. Family, friends, loved ones, pandemic, all of that's happening all at once. And many of us may very well um, not be able to meet a, a deadline. Trust me when I say I understand. And what I would like to do is provide you the opportunity to make up your work. Now, it doesn't go without penalty, however, but you can make up your work. It is important that you communicate with me if you have a difficulty, if you can foresee. Not always you can do that, but if you foresee you have an issue or problem, email me, let me know. I'll grant you that extension of time. And if, it, if I grant you that extension of time, I'm going to open up that particular assignment so that you can upload it on a normal basis. We'll complete the quiz or other assignment in, a, in, um, in the appropriate uh, box within the course classroom. The most important thing is communicating with me if you have difficulties. Believe me, I understand. I just need to know. I don't want you not to turn in your assignment. We are working in seven weeks and we don't have much time. So if you see something that's going to happen, if something's going to um, prevent you um, from getting your assignment done, reach out to me immediately upon that knowledge so we can work together on a suitable due date that you can continue with the course and be successful, obviously. So the next step then is to get you familiar with me. Um, I have been teaching with Hack for a number of years and been doing, um, um, I've been enjoying it actually in the face-to-face -face component of courses. I love it because I get a chance to meet all of you and talk to you and get to know you. Uh, unfortunately, the class is only seven weeks, so it's um, not going to be long that we get to know each other, but we will do our best. So when I, we meet together, let's make the class time that we have as fun and engaging as possible. There will be some structure, but for the most part, let's just get to know each other, talk about those concepts and see how we can apply them into the real world, if we can, and then go over any questions that you might have. So that being said, let's talk about the chapter. Managerial accounting. Now remember, managerial is different from financial accounting. Financial accounting is used for corporations and they um, provide external users information that they need to make a decision. But we're going to be talking about managerial accounting. So the first thing we want you to do when you're reading through your chapters, you really want to know what makes the two different. Why are they different? There's nothing saying that is good or bad or not so good and lukewarm. What I want to make important is both are very, very important parts of accounting, but they have different purposes and they have different parameters in which they work. And that's what we want to get through that. Also, we're going to describe the planning and control functions by managers. Why do we care about managers? Because the key to this course is managerial accounting, accounting used by managers. So we're going to be getting really deep into details, whereas financial may not get too deep. And it's not intended to get too deep because we're, we're only emphasizing external users. But internal users of information needs far more detail, far more information, and looking at things in a very, very different way. So we need to deviate from gap in some, in some ways. We're going to def, um, define some of the, 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 the structures or the functions of finance and accounting personnel. We're going to talk about ethical conduct and what are the ethics that accountants face. The real issues that go down, that, that happens in our world. And we'll also talk about accounting systems. When we my accounting systems, how, what system are we going to use for financial information, getting information, and using that information? We're going to talk about the terms that are related to cost purposes. And again, this, this chapter is a foundation chapter. So if it's possible for you to um, print out this PowerPoint, that would be great. Because I think a lot of this information you're going to be seeing again and again. And it's very important to see that. It's not, um, you're not going to see it once. You're going to have to understand these terms and be using these terms throughout the course. How do costs flow and how do we use and how is it presented in terms of our cost of goods sold account and preparing a income statement for a manufacturing or company? If you've taken your accounting 101 class, you kind of know what I'm leading to here. So, accounting objective one, what's the difference between financial and managerial accounting? And here are just some of the very distinct differences in categories. Why are they different? What makes them different? And what's their overall purpose? Financial accounting is internal, um, it's externally for focused. Government Governments care about that. They want to have government information, like for your tax returns 
like for any other information about your organization, for investors, providing investors appropriate information to make a decision about your organization. Management accounting is really about the internal users. Managers need to make some very, very um, specific costing information. How should we price a product? Should we discontinue that product? What is our break even? What is our volume or our margin of safety? Those kind of questions cannot be answered from a financial accounting perspective. It's just not available. Um, the financial statements are good and good information, relevant information, but for an accounting um, within your internal ranks, you really need more data. And managerial accounting provides that data. It drills down to the nitty gritty. It really gets into the meat of what the organization's doing. And it provides information not necessarily seen or could be discovered on a set of basic financial statements or it's a company notes. So here's just a view of what makes them different. I would suggest you really understand what makes them different because when you're going through this course, you're gonna be thinking, well, why do I need to um, evaluate this particular product? Because the internal users, users like managers want to make sure that that particular pro product is profitable. Let me give you an example. If you're trying to manufacture, in this case, manufacture a product, and you need to know how much it costs to manufacture that product. Why would managers need to have that information? Think about it for a second. Why would a manager need to know how much it costs to manufacture a product? The reason why they need to know is because they need to be able to determine what our appropriate selling price is. They need to know if they're covering the cost sufficiently well in order for them to achieve a certain level of profitability. They need to know how many units it takes for them to break even, meaning they don't suffer a loss, but they don't earn a profit. Lots and lots of questions that managers need to, do, to answer. And that's part of their planning and directing and controlling business operations, essentially. They want to make certain that their reports are worthwhile and can be used to make those decisions. Why do we care? Because we want to make certain that our organization, our managers can make choices on whether I should sell this product, I should close this the division, and what is my break even, and what is my margin of safety. That information is vital. How do you think about when you, when you go to the store and you're trying to purchase a product and you find out later that that product was discontinued? Have you ever wondered why? My hope is before this course is out that you will be able to answer that question. They were able to determine that their costs outweighed the benefit. Their cost was too high. Their product or that product was not sufficient in terms of revenue generation to cover its cost. And you can actually think about it in a very different way. So it becomes important because you don't have to become an accountant to understand this. And you don't have to have a, become an accountant to want to know this. In fact, you really need to know this. And many of the people that I work with and the people that need information from me are not accountants, but they still need the information. And it needs to be given to them in such a way that they can make a pretty informed decisions, practical ones. So, so managerial accounting is going to be um, using relevant information. We want a co contrasting to that will be objective information, free of bias. Get me? Where a managerial, you know, it's going to be biased because we're using internal information. We're using our subjective judgment here. You get what I mean? So the next thing is going to be segments of companies, regions. We need various different types of information. And a financial statements doesn't break it out by units, by customers, by geographical location, by divisions. It doesn't. It doesn't make financial accounting wrong. It's just that when you have very specific needs, you need to make certain that you understand why financial accounting would not be appropriate and why managerial accounting is appropriate. And that's the key here. And again, a managerial accounting does use some of the accounting concepts that we learn in financial accounting. It does use some gap. It does find gap in, in its process, but we're not relying on it. And in fact, the reports that you'll see as examples in your text will very much make some changes that will not be acceptable to gap. 
So that's what I love about this, of course, because I think we can we can move remove the 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 gap accounting cap off of our heads and be more flexible about the reports that we generate and how we gather the information. Meaning, do we need to use accrual basis? Can't we use a cash? Well, in the managerial, depends on what you're looking for and the type of questions that you need answered. Yes. And that's why I find managerial accounting so much fun. Um, it's not imposing limits that are uh, restrictive, um, implications of disclosure, because it's all for us internally to the organization. So planning and control. Now, a manager, think about it. I don't know if any of you are managers, but if you're a manager, you need to be able to have some idea of what's going on within your, your group. You want to be able to a plan. That means establish goals. What are we to achieve? And then how do we communicate that to our employees so that we can work together to achieve that, that goal? We provide oversight and direction. We work to we work to, for in terms of implementation, whether or not we achieved our goals, and we make changes. Again, it's all about the evolution of change and using information to evolve and grow within our organization. So we're going to plan, direct, control, give feedback, and then go back around. And this is definitely an evolving thing. It never happens just in a, in a vacuum. This is a constant thing, depending on what's going on with your organization at that time. But you're constantly planning and directing and making and controlling and evaluating, getting feedback, and then going all the way back to that process. So the flow chart is pretty, a pretty nice tool to show that flow. So remember, your responsibilities of managers is going to be plan, direct, and control. What does plan entail? Setting goals and objectives and a mean by which to achieve them. Overseeing that process from day to day and evaluating the results, making changes when needed. So accounting personnel. I'm an accountant by trade. Many of you will be in marketing or management or human resources, and some of you might be in accounting. But again, understanding accounting and how their role impacts what you plan to do is really important because it really facilitates good communication among the, the group. Accountants understand what you need and can give you what you need and they can teach you how to interpret that information so that you can, in fact, meet your obligations, your planning, your directing, your controlling, your process. So um, an accountant, and this one here um, is very general and is not necessarily attributable to every type of organization. Now for profits may have a different structure. So, but in general, we're going to have a committee that oversees the audit. If that exists with the organization, you're going to have your CEO and CFO. You might even have a COO. And here are some general outlines of that. Again, don't get so, you know, involved in the nitty gritty of it. Just understand in general, some organizations do have a hierarchy like this. So let me make certain that you can see my screen. So just a second. There we go. Okay, so the skills that are required. Again, we're starting slow, but I do want you to see how intuitive this information is and how often that people take it for granted. But there are um, non-technical competencies that are needed. You need to be able to communicate, not only orally, but in writing. You need to possess um, a leadership and you know how to collaborate. Teamwork is key. We are working now in an environment where there is no lone ranger. Is everybody working together, playing a, a very specific role and contributing to the whole of that organization and its mission and goals and accomplishments. So not only do you know how to plan and, and, and report and, and, um, and to manage costs and also understanding internal controls and decision making analysis, but you also need to have a collaborative and leadership orientation as well. So ethics. Again, why do we do what we do? I want to provide a service to an organization that provides them with support that they need for strategic planning, or I want to help them with their tax strategy. Well, I have to be honest. I have to be clear. I have to provide them with good information so that they can make a right choice. Ethical is more than just rules and regulations, right and wrong. It's really about critical judgment using that information to make certain that you're doing the right thing for the right reasons in the right way. It's all I, and I can't say any more about risk, I mean, about ethics than that. Very, very important to have. 
So managerial is important for all careers, and I'm not here to, to, to guide you in what path you choose, but I do want you to see managerial accounting in, a, in the way that it's actually very, very useful to you. I love to see practical use of the information that I try to teach in the classes. I try to see that not everybody wants to be a CPA, but they do need CPAs and they need to understand um, to communicate well with them. But also CPAs need to understand and communicate with others as well. So having that knowledge is really going to be helpful um, just in your work. Why things happen the way they do when decisions are made. What was the process by which they made those decisions? So it's important to see how critical and how in the back scenes accounting does play a role. How accounting systems can help an organization. I think about accounting systems like software programs and how to use those programs to extract data, but you can also talk about using information from different associations, working together to practice, to, to actually help with the practice, help develop and educate, to advocate for the best practices for management and finance. And again, I just I, I'm just a fan of working with other professionals in my field so that we can provide better, higher level of quality to our clients. I believe accountants are a useful person, an individual discipline for all business processes. And so I'm always advocating for better education, not only in schools, but also for managers. And this is just giving you some ideas of the type of opportunities that an individual can explore. Um, the key, I would say, is the ethics, the statement of ethical practice. We need to understand one thing about accounting, and that is people are reliant on us to tell us the truth. But also not just to tell us the truth, but also to not be um, biased in our truth. We want to make certain that we tell people what's the right thing to do and we do not have any conflicts of interest. That's ethical. I'm not going to gain from telling you one way or the other. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to help you to make the right choice, but I'm not going to benefit from it. That's all. That's the essence of ethical professional practice. Credibility. Honesty. That means integrity. Every information that I provide you is honest. It's clean. It's You can rely on it. No errors. Confidential. Keeping the information that's given to you is confidential information. Unless they want it to be revealed and having the skills necessary to do the job well. So as we close this chapter, one of the things that I want to make clear is understanding not all unethical behavior is illegal. And people always say, well, that's not illegal. Of course it's not illegal, but is it ethical? And understanding the difference in ethics and legality and why ethics goes beyond what's legal or illegal. Think about that as you go through the chapter today. Think about that and think about the principles of honesty, fairness, objectivity, free of bias, and responsibility, which is far, far, far broader than what's illegal. And as I close the chapter, I do want to say that when we think about managerial accounting, we think about how can we present information, financial information and non-financial information to managers to help them with their core three responsibilities. And with that, I want to mention also about accounting systems and software. We talk about QuickBooks, we talk about Sage, which used to be called Peachtree, and how do we use data? Where do we get the data? Can we rely on the data? And in the, and in the managerial accounting context, the data that we receive from our information technology, QuickBooks being one example, we have to think, we have to know that the people that put that information in the system, that the information is free of bias, that there's no errors that we can rely on to make decisions, that we can use this information to analyze data and make choices that are important for our organization. So understanding how accounting has become this big software driven type of process is only seeing it from a very narrow lens. Accounting is far more than just information in a QuickBooks program. 
more than just a debit and a credit. It's about the numbers, what it represents, and how we can use that numbers and format that information to communicate to people who need to have questions answered and decisions made. So think about what we're doing. Make logic about what we're doing. Critical analysis of data. So now we are a global organization. We're a global economy. We can communicate with people across the globe. We use information technology to do that. So we are knowledge based, but not all knowledge is right. We have to scrutinize our knowledge. We have to make certain our knowledge can be verified. We have to make certain that we have the information that's accurate and we can rely on it and it's timely. So globalization is important and it has implications in managerial accounting. And I understand that in general, how that helps you, what type of barriers that that were existed 20 years ago that no longer exist. But that puts a tremendous responsibility on our managerial accountants because now we've got a lot of information. We have to make certain that the information that we share for the use of our managers is accurate and the information is provided in a timely fashion. I'm really grateful for the fact that we can extend our work beyond the walls of our nation, but it becomes a very huge responsibility. So. Think about that as we're going through this chapter. Focus on how can we decrease our waste? How can we lower our costs? And what happens when we waste time, when we waste less time? How can we have a better response to our customers? This is not financial accounting at all, and questions cannot be answered in that way. So thinking about things, when we think about quality, we're thinking about timeliness, those kinds of qualitative type of analysis go a little bit beyond the financial accounting, which in my opinion brings depth to this uh, changing environment that accounting finds itself. Sustainability, how can we sustain it? Now for me, as an investment professional, ESG is it for me. Societal, environmental, economic, and governance. How can we maintain the pillars of our social and environmental responsibilities? And that's a broad definition, but let me tell you, how can we present information in an uncompromised way so that future generations can meet their own needs. SOX um, Act of 2002 does rely on the financial side, but understand what it does. It's really about maintaining trust and maintaining accountability, plain and simple. And it does that through enhancing its financial reporting, regulations, and internal control, all of which you have talked about or learned within a previous accounting course. And I just want to just highlight these, not a major um, issue, but it does rely on honesty and it does tie into the ethical component of accounting and how vital it is for us to be credible in providing information to those who use our data. Business trends and regulation affecting management of accounting. What information do you need? How big is your company? If you're a small organization, you don't need an enterprise system. You may very well do well with a Sage or with QuickBooks. How complex are our transactions? The data, what kind of data are you trying to track? Is it voluminous data? Is it simple data? Is it more quantitative data? What information you're looking for? And again, getting all the information you need and sitting down and thinking about what kind of costs that we need to deal with, what kind of costs that's involved in that. Now. In this course, you're going to deal with a lot of different terms, um, and I, I implore you to take this particular learning objective and keep it in your arsenal. Direct costs, indirect costs, direct materials, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead. Those categories are going to follow you, so let's go over the terms. When you can trace something directly to an object that's being produced, it's a direct cost. And I'll give an example. An um, automobile. An automobile that you're manufacturing, what's a direct cost? All of the raw materials, the tire, that could, the engine, the transmission, the nuts, the bolts, all of that. That's direct cost. Indirect cost would be what? If you're thinking about indirect costs that you can't attribute specifically to that car being manufactured, 
that would more likely be the managers, right? The people who manage the frontline labor workers, people who are actually putting the pieces together. We have a manager, somebody over there, or a supervisor. The supervisor would very much could very much be an indirect cost. What about direct materials and direct labor? Laborers who actually are building it, materials that are actually become a physical part of the product. And then we get this catch-all called manufacturing overhead. And these are costs that are other than direct materials and direct labor. That includes indirect costs, right? Indirect costs could be depreciation of the machinery, right? You use a machine for 10 years and the cost associated with that, that particular machinery gets spread over its life. That depreciation is going to be an indirect cost. It should be added to the price of that particular product that you're trying to sell. But it's not a direct cost. It's indirect. So understanding what they are, and we're going to see a lot of these terms used in the, in the chapters, in the chapters ahead. So know what they need, how to apply them, and when they are necessary to answer specific questions and when they're not, which is going to be quite important. This particular spreadsheet here that you see is a good idea of what and how to look at traceable costs and then costs that you can't trace, which are going to be indirect costs and where they appear within your financial information. And again, we're talking about direct costs. Direct costs includes direct materials and direct labor. We're talking about indirect costs, which could be supervision, depreciation, and we're talking about overhead cost allocation. And that's going to be important. So in this chapter, think about those types of things because we're going to get really deep into it very, very quickly. Also, if you can see here, this looks like to me a standard set of financial statements. In this case, the income statements for the end, end of the year, December 31st. But think about it from a, manu a merchandising firm. How does it look? A little bit different in a merchandising firm. And you see the cost of goods sold there before. And here it is after. Now, the next step is, how do we look at the cost of goods sold and how is it calculated? Again, we've talked about this in previous financial reporting classes that you may have taken, but we're going to start with our beginning inventory, add our purchases, we come to our goods available for sale, which is going to be the adding the inventory, beginning inventory plus your purchases, take out our ending inventory, and we come up with our cost of goods sold, which then appears on line C7 of the spreadsheet. Chapter one is a very fundamental chapter. Take the time to read through it very, very carefully as it will begin your journey to managerial accounting. This has been a 37 minute presentation. I hope that it provided you with the information on the course itself, what the expectations are, how to navigate the course, what type of activities that will be graded and ungraded, how to access those as well, how to access your discussions, which is going to be a very big part of your understanding and learning and engaging with me and with your class, the quizzes and homeworks, the papers, and also your final and midterm examinations. We will talk about this more in our first meeting on Monday, and we'll answer all of your questions and review chapter one with an example. So be prepared to ask, ask some questions and I'll be prepared to answer them. And thank you so much for your patience, and I look forward to talking with you soon.